Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Kevin Schaefer. I'm an associate professor of sociology here at BYU, um, and it's my pleasure to introduce Stéphane Lassard, uh, who is uh, the Consulate General of Canada um, in Denver, uh, which he uh, started that post in August of 2016. So as Canada's Consul General in Denver, Stéphane oversees a team of 17 people who work within Colorado, Kansas, Montana, Utah, and Wyoming to strengthen trade and economic ties, enhance political, academic, and cultural links, and assist Canadians visiting or living in the five-state U.S. Mountain West region. Stefan began his career practicing commercial law in Montreal before joining the Canadian federal government in 1993, where he's held numerous senior and executive positions. Prior to arriving in Denver, Stefan spent the last 10 years with Health Canada, where he served in different executive positions across the offices of the chief scientist. He has also worked with the Canadian Space Agency, where as the head of international affairs, he oversaw relationships with foreign, national, and multinational space agencies, and with Global Affairs Canada's Global Partnership Program, where he focused on preventing the spread of weapons of mass destruction. He's a native of Montreal, uh, and he and his wife have three children. So um, join me in welcoming Stefan. Thank you so much, uh, Samantha. And thank you to all of you. Thank you, Kevin and the faculty, for your kind invitation. Uh, I couldn't be happier with, to be here with my colleagues. I want to introduce them, Andy and Megan from our office here, um, helping me out. We have an ambitious program for today and the next couple of days. Uh, this is my fourth, uh, third or fourth time in, uh, in uh, Utah. Uh, however, uh, it's just getting started. We, we, I love to come back here. And there's many opportunities to do that into the future, including involving academic collaboration between this university and Canadian universities. So uh, happy to be here. I hope what is coming in terms of this presentation will be interesting to you. Uh, we, I hope to get through it in, in not too much time so that we have a conversation. Really, that's always the more interesting part, uh, the, the questions and answers and the, and the, and the, the discussion. So. Um, you know, we're going to get going. We have um, a bit of a funky approach to this, whereby we start with a little fun part, where we have a quiz and goodies to hand out, and we'll t we'll test your really deep knowledge. Not so deep. I'm joking. Uh, your knowledge of Canada or Canadians, and uh, we're going to get going with this, and then there will be the the proper presentation. I swear, and then we'll end on a, a fun note as well. So. Without further ado, uh, I'm going to come back to that um, later. The pop quiz. My colleagues Andy and Megan will help me out with this. I'm going to modify those rules a little bit. Um, shoot up your hand. I'll be the spotter. Andy will be the uh, prize giver. <laughs> <laughs> Andy, you want to start? Yeah, I'll start. Okay. <laughs> so we're not going too deep in history here. Yeah, yeah. The answer indeed is Ryan Philippe. We're not dating ourselves at all here. <laughs> <laughs> so I believe we go next to yeah. question two. Oh, I, saw, I saw your hand back there. Yes, was it hungry? Let's go to the next slide. You are correct. Hey. Do we have a, one, more. one more? Yeah. That one's easy. I'm going to go for you. Correct. Yes, that is true. I'm happy it's not SpongeBob or, or the Minion or whatever it was. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so we'll go back a little bit to the objectives of our presentation. Uh, I want to start a little bit big picture with um, the um, broader, can I should stay here, the, the broader can Canada-US relationship. I want to talk a little bit about the importance of our relations between Canada uh, writ large and Utah, uh, a very profound relationship, really important. 
Uh, I'll talk a little bit about NAFTA, which is the main sort of theme of the presentation, why it matters, where are we in the negotiations, uh, and what's ahead of us a little bit. And then um, if you're so moved to agree with us that NAFTA is important, we'll have some ideas as how do you, you can get involved, particularly uh, given your, your, uh, your academic and maybe professional interest in um, international affairs. Uh, uh, you know, I think there's a, this is a point in time when uh, many voices need to, be, need to be heard. So skipping over, um, to the main part of the presentation. So um, I don't need to do this here, but uh, you'd be surprised how many um, folks I meet sometimes. I have an impression that uh, we are known for the weather we bring south uh, to, to, to the US, but uh, the, the awareness of Canada, especially as a trading partner, uh, is a little bit um, less, um, uh, less high than I would like sometimes. So uh, we are, of course, uh, your friendly neighbor to the north. We're also your, your number one partner and ally. Why is that? Because we built this continent together. We truly did. Um, you know, our, our businesses did, but more importantly, our ancestors did. Uh, folks who uh, grew up and worked together across borders or families who uh, help settle the West, perhaps, uh, who came from Canada uh, or who came to the Canadian West and then came down. Uh, American families who helped settle the early days in Montreal and, uh, and of course, uh, the rest of our history. So uh, what I'd like to say is that the relationship between Canada and the U.S., and this applies to Utah specifically, it's not just strategic because we have trading, a trading relationship which is so important. We have... Um, energy um, independence issues that we work together with an inter integrated energy infrastructure. We're your number one provider of energy, a f foreign provider. Uh, it's not just strategic, it's personal. This relationship is about people, it's about families that moved across the border at different times in the past. In still today, it's about friendships that get, that get formed uh, at a university campus like this one or uh, otherwise. It's about our people who uh, build this place together. And not only did we build this continent together, we defend it together. Um, there's a reference to NORAD here. Many people know that NORAD is responsible for managing uh, the early warning of threats to the North American airspace. Uh, not many people know that uh, NORAD uh, is a shared institution with Canada under a treaty, which is about 60 years old. NORAD will celebrate its 60th, 60th anniversary this coming May. And uh, the, the commander of NORAD is always an American general, but few people know that the deputy commander is always a Canadian general. And if I may say, on that fat fateful day on 9-11, when the Twin Towers and the Pentagon and other flights were, uh, were affected and uh, these terrible things happened. In fact, the, the Canadian general was in charge of NORAD airspace. So it's the Canadian general that worked with the integrated American Canadian team to dispatch aircraft uh, here and there to make sure that everybody was as, as safe as possible. So that's there's no better poster child for the integrated nature of our relationship than NORAD. And in fact, it's a theme that I will hit on during the presentation. We have an integrated economy. We have an integrated defense partnership. We have integrated energy infrastructure. This, this place, we built it together. So speaking about the, again, big picture to start with, the Canada-US trade relationship, it's enormous. It's the biggest bilateral trading relationship in the world. We are, uh, in 2016, two-way trade in goods and, goods and services was about uh, $626 billion, or $28 billion. So that translates to about $2 billion a day of two-way trade across the border, or about $1.4 million a minute. That's enormous. Uh, no trading relationship comes close anywhere in the world. Uh, that supports an enor enormous numbers of jobs in Canada, of course, but also in the U.S. Did you know that um, in, in, 
in uh, America, 9 million jobs depend directly on trade and investment with Canada. 9 million jobs. That's a lot. And we'll come back to that and the role of NAFTA. Um, and in fact, uh, there's a reference here to the, the relationship, the trading relationship being fair and, and balanced. Uh, that's important because if you read the papers, you hear a lot of voices, most, mostly coming out of Washington, uh, talking about deficits and why they're so bad and why all the America's trading partners are fleecing America and how could this be? And, and uh, you know, uh, I would like to say that uh, we have, in fact, a, Canada has a deficit or you have a surplus within trade with Canada. So uh, this, uh, this uh, trading relationship, goods and services all included, America has a $8 billion surplus. You, you, so you sell more than you buy from us by $8 billion um, uh, in 2016. If we take out, if we, that's mostly services, a big part of your economy. In, in goods, the, the, Canada has a surplus, but that's only because we sell you a lot of oil if, to run your economy. If we take out the oil and you focus on manufactured goods, America has a $36 billion surplus with Canada. So all that talk about disappearing manufacturing jobs and NAFTA and so on, it certainly has nothing to do with Canada. You have a big surplus with Canada. So I'll just park that and we'll get to the next point, which is we are your number one trading partner. Uh, I like to mention that because that's not so well known. People might assume that you hear a lot about China, Japan, Europe uh, in the news, often related to some dispute or other. We are Canadians. We're good guys, right? We don't like, we don't like to be, especially if you're Canadians, you would agree with this, but we don't start we don't start fights. We um, will have one if needed, but we're not we're not fond of fights. So it's really easy to overlook that we are your number one trading partner. But more importantly, or, or or to add to that, we're your number one customer. So get this: we buy more. We Canada buy more from the U.S. than all of China, all of Japan, and all of the U.K. combined. Think about this. Because you hear a lot about these other countries and how important they are. They are. But Canada buys more than all of these countries combined, or alternatively, all of Europe combined, the whole European Union. So I would venture to say Canada matters to your economy. I know you like us because we're good guys. But also because it supports those 9 million jobs. Also because... Um, you know, that trade supports uh, more consumer goods for, for, uh, and, and great quality parts for your, your companies and, uh, and so on and so forth. So we are the number one customer of 35 U.S. states. It's not the case for uh, Utah. I think we are number three in this case. Uh, the U.K. is uh, your number one customer. There's another country and then Canada. But we are number one, two, or three for 48 of the 50 states. Moving on, I talked about the theme of integratedness. This is just one more manifestation where under NAFTA in particular, we have not only do we sell more to each other, we, sell, we, we have tripled the trade between the three nations under NAFTA. But not only do we sell more to each other, we make things together in a wholly different way because NAFTA lowered tariffs and non-tariff barriers, enabled the companies, not the governments, it's not governments doing this, it's companies, American companies, Canadian and Mexican, enabled these companies to decide to work together differently and to integrate the supply chains. So an American company, in this case, this may be a GM vehicle, uh, decided to source many parts from uh, American uh, America, but also several parts of this rear assembly, rear suspension assembly would come from Canada. And you could look at uh, any other car or truck or vehicle and it would be the same, maybe with some Mexican parts thrown in. So the point here is we've built under NAFTA an integrated economy with integrated supply chains. Our companies have done this so that we can be competitive and sell with it to each other, competitive products for our consumers, but importantly, to outcompete the rest of the world. 
Our companies are doing this because it makes them more competitive to source parts reliably, affordably from different parts of the continent and then outcompete China, outcompete Europe, outcompete Japan, and so on. A more interesting part, uh, exempla, exem, example of the integrated nature of our um, supply chains is the Great American Burger. You might agree, even though we're after lunch. Um, because this is, so this is talking about the agricultural sector. Who doesn't love a good burger unless you're vegan, like my daughter? But, uh, but she's trying to, is, my daughter is vegan. She's trying very hard, but her, her sister is a, a carnivore of the first magnitude. And so it, it's becoming very difficult. But you would agree that a great burger is a great burger. And in this case, it's a good example of the integrated um, collaboration between our firms. To make this burger, you might have a situation where the cattle, excuse me, so the beef, so this, this patty here, the beef may be uh, from cattle born in Alberta, raised in Nebraska and processed in Colorado, or maybe here, who knows. Uh, and then the bun may come from uh, wheat, uh, from flour uh, from one of our provinces, Saskatchewan, or it could easily be from Kansas and uh, elsewhere, even here. And you see the rest of the story. So all these parts come from different parts of, our North, of North America to make a single great product. And so that's, that's really the point that I'm trying to make is we make great things together and we outcompete the rest of the world. Now, I'm going to the Utah-Canada relationship specifically. I don't expect you to read all these numbers. What I'd like you to retain is we are uh, your number one trade and your number two trading partner, goods and services included. I talked about number three earlier for us being a customer of Utah, but if you if you go for two-way trade, we're your number one, uh, your number two trading partner. And that trade uh, was in 2016 worth about $3.3 billion. It's, um, it's trade that supports about 79,000 jobs here in Utah. These are Canadian companies like Stantec, which is a, uh, an engineering and consulting firm, like Crescent Point, an oil and gas shale company, uh, others that um, are employers here of Americans, but also many American companies like doTERRA and others that trade with Canada that are expanding their trade with Canada. And the more you sell to Canada, the more you need employees here to support that production and that sale. So 79,000 jobs depend on trade and investment with Canada. I mentioned that because uh, we're gonna talk about NAFTA in a second and what happens if we don't have it. And those jobs, many of them are, uh, are in fact uh, vulnerable. So moving on to NAFTA. Uh, oh, sorry. I think this slide should populate. Um, excuse me for my I'm hoping text will appear. If not, I will speak to it. So let me just speak to it. NAFTA is a trade agreement, of course. It's actually a successor agreement to what came before in the 1980s, which was the Canada-US Free Trade Agreement. So in the, uh, around eight, 1984, the bilateral Canada-US Free Trade Agreement came in, and that worked well. And the objective of that was essentially to further integrate the economies, um, you know, create jobs, obviously, lower tariffs, lower non-tariff barriers, promote the movement of professionals across the border, just enable more business uh, for the joint prosperity of Canada and the U.S. Now, in the 1990s, it was, it was decided to bring in Mexico. So uh, 1993 when, is when uh, the NAFTA, the current NAFTA, North American Free Trade Agreement with Mexico was concluded and signed. So we have an agreement that's essentially about 25 years old uh, that needs to be modernized. I'll get back to that, but of course, you know, an agreement like that, uh, the world changes, economy changes, you need to modernize it. But what NAFTA has done, even before we talk about changing it, is created a, a, a powerhouse, an economic powerhouse between the three countries, North America, that represents 7% of global population, but 28% of global GDP. So think about that. 
7% of population, 28% of GDP. Of course, America represents the vast majority of that 28%, but Canadian GDP is not bad, and uh, Mexican is growing fast. And so we've created this economic powerhouse that can continue to outcompete the rest of the world if we'll just uh, let it. Moving on to, I believe, a few myths about NAFTA. Uh, these are things that we often hear about or read in the press. So I just wanted to dispel them quickly. The first one being that NAFTA is responsible for the trade deficit that America has. First of all, America has a trade deficit with many countries, but not with Canada. As I mentioned, uh, you have a, a surplus of $8 billion uh, in, 19, in 2016 with Canada. You do have one with Mexico. However, that, that trade deficit with Mexico is uh, relatively small compared to countries that you have a trade deficit with. So uh, China, for example, is, is ballooning and growing, and um, I think it, to the despair of many people. But, uh, well, of course, if they were in NAFTA, it would be different. But in, in the, the trade deficit with China is 4.6 uh, times bigger than your trade deficit with NAFTA countries, in this case, Mexico. So the, I think the, I'll, I'll move on quickly, but the, the point is, a free trade agreement is actually good for controlling trade deficits and enabling more balanced trade because it's, the rules of the road are clearer. And your bigger trade deficits are with not non-NAFTA countries. So the next myth is that NAFTA has led to significant job losses in the US. Uh, this is a complicated question. I'll give you the, the bird's eye view answer and please let me know if there are any questions during the discussion. So the first thing to remember is, yes, there are impacted communities where manufacturing jobs in particular have been lost. It's true in Canada, it's true in America, it's true in most advanced economies, NAFTA, never mind NAFTA. Uh, so the, the, the thing to remember is that the main factor for the loss of manufacturing jobs is not trade, to the contrary. Trade adds jobs, typically. There are some lost, it adds more than are lost. The main factor contributor is technology, it's automation. And if you've studied this, if you're in business, you might know this, that uh, a recent study from an American, all the numbers I'm quoting, by the way, are American. I uh, just wanna be sure that's clear. But a recent study from the East Coast, I forget which university, was saying that for every job, a manufacturing job in the US lost to trade, there are about seven or eight lost to technology. So I'll just say that, and for every job lost to trade, there are some, but you, you think so often about uh, car makers in America offshoring jobs to Mexico. That is less than 1% of the phenomenon of lost manufacturing jobs in, in America. So again, technology is the bigger factor. Offshoring is a factor, but not the biggest one. And um, in fact, trade and NAFTA have created far more jobs than they have. Uh, dis displaced. And the reason is more goods are produced, more services, more jobs needed. So the agricultural community, uh, sometimes I've been very concerned. Uh, some people have been concerned about the health of your agricultural community. Uh, I can tell you quickly that the agricultural sector is the one that has benefited the most from NAFTA. And certainly they are the most vocal in advocating for the continuation of NAFTA. So nothing could be further from the truth that NAFTA is impairing the U.S. agricultural community. Hoping for a response, thank you. So I'll gloss over this. This is a, big, a bit of a summary uh, to some of the points I've made. The only one I would uh, address here is this one, dealing with lowered prices and increased options. Think about, uh, think about Walmart. Walmart has probably done most uh, for uh, the working class in our countries and, uh, and uh, to, make, to make sure there's more goods available to people at affordable prices. So, of course, Canada is just one supplier to Walmart, but the point is that with more trade at lower prices comes more choice. More choice, more options for consumers at affordable prices. So where are we, uh, where do we stand now before we look at the future of NAFTA? Where we stand now, uh, so the first slide is about Canada's objectives. 
uh, I get asked, what are, what are Canada's objectives in these negotiations? So the first one is, we want a win-win-win agreement. We completely, we completely disagree with, the, with uh, the message that we hear sometimes from Washington that, um, that trade, trade negotiations have to be like a hockey game when there's a winner and a loser. We don't believe it, it's not true. Uh, why would countries trade or negotiate an agreement if it's not that all of them would benefit? So we have all benefited from the first NAFTA. We must all benefit from the renegotiated NAFTA. We have some ideas to modernize the agreement, um, you know, for opening up government procurement, uh, you know, uh, other objectives. You see some are listed here uh, because we think that there are opportunities to make the agreement a little bit more progressive. The key goal that Canada has here is to make sure that trade does not, or NAFTA, does not benefit just the 1% at the top of the economic pyramid. If we do that, we are going to lose our, work, uh, our working people and our middle class. We are looking to create opportunities for the middle class and those hoping to join it. Uh, we have to broaden the benefits. So underrepresented groups like indigenous people, like, in fact, women, uh, you know, oppor new opportunities to create businesses and trade. These are objectives that we have in addition to uh, better environmental standards and labor standards. So, so if you read the, the press, um, you, f you find that Canada and uh, its negotiating partners are having a tough go at these negotiations, to be frank. We're very confident we will get there, but think about this. We're in uh, the early part of February. The negotiations are supposed to be finished by the end of March. By the end of March, we're supposed to be done. Now, uh, we've made a lot of progress. There have been six, six negotiating rounds, the more recent one in my hometown, Montreal. Uh, the next one being in Mexico City later this month and early March. We made some good progress, but I would say on the easier stuff. There remain a handful of uh, issues and again, I, I need to speak frankly because we're all among friends. These, in our view, are um, uh, positions, issues that have been proposals put on the table by America that we find, to be polite, unconventional. So these are uh, difficult proposals for us. And I list, I list a, a few here. Uh, the auto rules of origin the proposal would increase the North American content from 60 to 82 uh, or 85 percent, but require 50 percent at least sourced in, in America. So any car, vehicle, whatever, 50 percent should be coming from America, which I'm sure sounds great to an American audience until you know that American automakers don't support this. They don't support it because it makes them less competitive. If they do that, they will disrupt their established supply chains. It will increase the price of the vehicle and probably price them out in Europe and Asia and elsewhere. So one example of a proposal that sounds good on the surface, but the economics don't work. And we don't see how it benefits Canada, frankly. And we're not going to be, we're, we want a deal, but not just any deal. There are some other examples here we can come back to if you're interested during the question period. So what happens in the hypothetical, I hope, hypothetical situation where there is no NAFTA? Let's say, for example, the U.S. withdraws from NAFTA, which is a possibility. Every day, it seems, uh, the American president will mention the possibility of that happening. So um, if that were to happen, we would revert back to before NAFTA when most favored nation tariffs under the World Trade Organization would apply. So we, trade would continue, but under tariffs. The average tariff to sell into Canada is not very high. It's 4%. But if you look at particular sectors like agriculture, you find that selling beef into Canada, as you do, would, would involve a 25% tariff or chicken 75%. Uh, textiles and apparel is different, uh, very high. Wheat, 76%. So we essentially a tax on American exporters, making you guys, making your producers of goods and services less competitive uh, in uh, the Canadian market the, and the Mexican market. That would lead tr directly to lost jobs. 
I talked about 79,000 jobs in Utah being supported by trade and investment with Canada. Our estimates are that 18 to 36,000 of those jobs would disappear if NAFTA were to disappear. And the sad truth is that the first jobs to go would be low-skilled jobs. The numbers increase if we, if we go for higher skilled jobs. But these are real people in your communities uh, whose jobs would be impacted. Of course, Canada would suffer too, but, not to this, uh, but this would be real also in, in America. So this brings me, back, bring me to the last uh, slide before we conclude on a fun note. What can you do? If, if you're convinced that trade is beneficial, not just to your partners, but to yourselves. It creates more products and services to be sold, more jobs in America and in Utah. If you believe that's the case, there are things you can do, and this is the time to do it. Con you may, as individuals or as organizations, contact your congressmen, contact your senators. As far as I know, they're all pro-trade, but they need to hear from their constituents. You may write to the White House, write to your president, Write to Secretary uh, Ross, Commerce Secretary, the U.S. Ambassador uh, uh, Lighthizer, uh, U.S. Trade Representative. There's many ways that you can do that, but make your voice known uh, as individuals and organizations because it really all counts. So with that, I will conclude the formal part of this and turning it on to my colleagues for uh, a fun conclusion. Let's see. Yes, indeed. Good guess. Good guess. So with that, I believe uh, it's up to us to thank you for your time and being with us today. I hope we still have time for questions and discussion. And um, thank you very much for your attention. All right, I've been asked to play police officer. So for questions, I don't know why, but, but <laughs> before we do that, um, we wanna thank um, Stefan for being here at BYU and uh, give him a token of our appreciation for him being here. So this is a, a speaker's plaque oh uh, from the Kennedy Center. So, <laughs> so thank you. Oh my God, <laughs> that's so nice of you, that's so nice of you. All right, so. Can we take yeah. a picture? Sure, we'll take a picture. <laughs> Can we hold it? Sure thing. One, two, three. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I'm definitely the worst looking thing in that picture. Um, all right, so uh, if you have any questions, um, I believe we can use this microphone right here um, because it is being recorded. We want to be able to get your voice. And if you could tell us your name and uh, either you know your major if you're a student or a department if you're a faculty member. Um, that would be appreciated. So, and we'll can I say floor. I want tough questions, not <laughs> just cream puffs? All right. So I will ask the first. I'll get us started. Okay. Since uh, you know I have the microphone. Sure. So um, I know one part of the NAFTA agreement, um, in addition to trade, is actually has to do with immigration, right? So um, Canadians can come into the United States on NAFTA visas, Americans can go into Canada on NAFTA visas. Um, what happens to um, immigration between the two countries if NAFTA collapses? Great question. Uh, can you hear me with this? Does that work? Um, I, I get asked that question. I have to say I'm not a great expert in the minutia of this, but it, you're right, under NAFTA, there are so-called TN visas that people, professionals, can, can use to, to come into Canada or vice versa from, to the U.S. and I'm guessing Mexico. To, these are professional class folks uh, to, to, uh, to, to join new companies or establish companies and, and so on and so forth. Theoretically, the answer to your question is if NAFTA goes away, those, that class of visa goes away because it's established by the treaty. So if the U.S. withdraws, that visa may still be available to Mexico, 
But if, if all of NAFTA goes away, then nothing is available. There are other ways for Canadians or Americans to come in to each other's country outside NAFTA. For example, America has the H-1B visa, and of course you have the, 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 the student visas and, the, and many other things, but uh, the, the more trade-oriented, professional class-oriented visas would, would, be disappear, would disappear unless governments put something in their place to replace that. I have to tell you that in Canada, not only we don't want to think too much about NAFTA going away, we're trying to make it better. And we have some ideas for in increasing the, the scope of the existing NAFTA visas because they apply to certain classes of professionals, they are good for a period of time, uh, and there are prerequisites to qualify. We're trying to open that up a little bit more. We, we see enormous energy, not just on the coast, but also in the middle, uh, across the U.S. and Canada and our people, um, mostly on the north-south um, uh, axis. We see a lot of energy of people uh, creating companies together and young companies getting started with uh, folks from across the border. And we need, we need to enable that more. So we have some ideas to open up the movement of professionals um, that's that's still being negotiated of course we'll see what happens Daniel Olson from the Department of Geography I'm proudly Canadian yes uh, quick question for you one of the one of your slides you said that as part of the national negotiations Canada wants to modernize and do some newer things with it including talking about gender equality and the rights of indigenous populations I was wondering how, if you could focus more specifically on how to include the rights of Indigenous or First Nations populations in an NAFTA agreement that is mainly economic in focus. No, it's a great question, and it may actually be something we need to clarify on that slide. We're not talking about a treaty that would directly give rights to Indigenous people. Uh, we're really, it, this is a trade agreement, so I think in the spirit of your question, uh, we're, our ambition is to put in place mechanisms where we can create new oppor economic opportunities, trading opportunities for our indig indigenous people in Canada and of course in the other two countries. So we're, we're involved in a painful process in Canada of reconciliation with our indigenous populations. Um, and it's difficult for us, but part of that is creating new economic opportunities. Now we're doing that within Canada, but we are a trading nation. So we are looking to um, work with American partners so we can create opportunities for our new indigenous businesses to trade maybe and to, to, to get to meet uh, like-minded uh, new businesses, uh, indigenous owned businesses in Canada and the US and Mexico and create opportunities for them to trade with each other and within the broader economy. So it's really that, that's the intention. Thank you, Daniel. I think the lady had a question earlier. Yes, I have a very specific you, Sorry. <laughs> I'm Jessica Tiega. I'm studying neuroscience. This is quite a specific question. But I was in Alberta this summer, and I noticed that milk was quite a lot more expensive than it is here. <laughs> and I thought that was interesting because it's in a region with so many cows. I was wondering, does that have anything to do with trade? Um, let me try an answer. It's hard to be... Um, very definite on a particular instance in a particular region at a particular time. I know, that's why I have I know, I know. I was afraid you were gonna ask me a question on neuroscience. No. I mean, <laughs> I, I swear, I'm trained as a lawyer, and the only reason I, I am that is because I couldn't do any of the things you do. So, um, th thank you for keeping it to trade. But <laughs> no, it, I think the answer is, in Canada, we have a system that we call managed supply and demand. So you hear quite a bit about that because it's, it's, it's part of the NAFTA negotiations also, particularly on the dairy. Uh, the American president is, uh, and others are uh, talking about why, why, um, why is our market more protected. Um, you know, so uh, to address your question, we have a system where supply and demand are more managed. And so we don't have a massive oversupply problem like America has. Wisconsin keeps, and other parts of your country, keep adding capacity that depresses prices for your producers. So we try to avoid situations like that in Canada. So we match supply to demand and, and we, will, we will only add capacity if the, 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 the market demands it. 
but that means that we don't have that depressing uh, oversupply uh, effect on prices, which means our prices typically generally would be a little higher than American prices. So that's really a macro answer to what I think is a more specific question. I apologize, but uh, maybe that's Thank helpful. You for answering that. that's perfect. Thank you. Not to mention milk in Utah is like stupid cheap. Oh yeah? Like, uh, cause a lot of states in the United States actually have price controls on, on milk. So for example, where I'm from Ohio, um, there are price controls on milk. So $4 a gallon for milk is not unheard of um, right. out east. So yeah, it varies a lot. Next uh, question. Can I, b before yeah. that, can I just maybe add a, one bit of answer? Um, what I said does not mean that the Canadian market is closed to American producers. American dairy farmers can sell into Canada. And in fact, you sell more, five times more into Canada, your producers, than, than our producers sell in the U.S. with a much larger market. So it's nothing like that that you hear in the press that we are a protected market. It's just um, there is one particular issue that leads to uh, some contention. But by, by and large, our market is as open as it can be under NAFTA. Please. Samantha Pierce, um, I'm a political science major here. Um, I was wondering, in your opinion, what is the biggest struggle with relations between Canada and the U.S.? Hmm. Well, um, struggle. Um, you know, I, I, I will try to answer that by saying that First of all, re relations are not that difficult. So going to the premise of the question, you know, what we have is a very complex relationship. The two most integrated economies in the world with a, an integrated defense relationship, with, with an en integrated energy infrastructure. Um, you know, the peaceful nations trading with each other, best friends and allies, def defending democracy elsewhere in the world. Uh, we are big countries with big economies and of course our relationship is going to be complicated it's going to be complex and issues will pop up but I, I personally and, I, and the government we don't think that there's anything unusual going on here we just happen to be in the in the context of a renegotiation uh, to a, an economic agreement which is a main platform for trade and negotiations lead to rhetoric sometimes and they can lead to overheated rhetoric sometimes and unintended consequences. But, uh, you know, in our view, this is all within, well within the ambit of normal relations. And I have to say that um, early on, uh, early in the presentation, I said our relations are strategic and they are per deeply personal. And that is far more important than any single leader or government in place at any time. So there have been episodes in the past where governments uh, were, uh, were more aligned in their priorities or more misaligned. But n I think you still see us advancing our shared goals together and our shared prosperity. So uh, I wouldn't think that we have a difficult relationship. In fact, we think we've, uh, we've got a great relationship with the Trump administration. We've got a lot of engagement, not always agreement, but easy access and a lot of engagement. And we're confident we're going to work through these issues. Well, I think uh, we're actually came to the end of our time. So let's uh, thank Stefan again for coming to BYU. Yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for this and for taking the time to be with us. Thank you.